topic of my talk is detection of gene fusions in a routine diagnostic laboratory. Um, the story of gene fusions is quite old in a way. I mean, it's more than 60 years ago when the first cytologists really saw that there are changes in the, cyto in, in the cytogenetics so just by banding looking. So quite later on, it was really discovered that this is this Philadelphia chromosome in CML. And even then, the story of fusion was even more pronounced because of, for example, the, the treatment of the CML cases with Gleevec and all these different approaches. Interestingly also, these gene fusions like BRAF fusions, ROS fusions, or NTRAC fusions are recognized more than 30 years ago, but now we are in a phase that all these different gene fusions are therapeutically targetable in the different tumor entities. Therefore, the detection of these different events, of course, is getting even more and more important. If we look a little bit on fusion databases, the list of gene fusions that nowadays have been discovered is quite huge. Not all of them are therapeutically uh, relevant or clinically relevant. There are also a lot of different inactivating mutations. But nonetheless, this list is constantly growing. And this is also, of course, something that we really have to tackle. It's not fusion in just single entities. We talk a lot, of course, about lung cancer fusions. It's a story that is throughout the different entities and throughout different body types. Of course, there are entities with a little bit more like lung cancer, where you have a lot of different gene fusions, but also in breast cancer, for example. It's a bit not in the much in the focus, but it's of course now we all know that we have, for example, anthrax fusions now coming into into the, the clinics. That this is a theme much more, and will uh, we will face much more of these tissues now in the lab, uh, independent of just the lung cancer fusions. Interestingly also is that we have several gene families actually that are showing these gene fusions. There are of course the NTREX family, but also FKFR uh, fusions have uh, in both the different family members, one to three different types of fusion events. So this is also something that we have to tackle a bit, uh, but this is also good for us for the pharmaceutical industry because they can concentrate on families and classes of tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Now, how to detect gene fusions? I mean, all of you are really familiar, of course, with different technologies, starting, of course, with immunohistochemistry using specific antibodies. We do not really detect gene fusions, of course, by this approach. What we detect is an overexpression of a protein. Most likely, in most cases, this is because there is a translocation that renders the gene target and then the specific promoter and upregulates. Fluorescent uh, in situ hybridization of fish as a gold standard for many, many years provides you a view, okay, you see a fusion. But in many cases, depending a little bit on the probe set that you're using, you don't have any information about the gene partner. This is something that is missing. Also, a little bit of sensitivity can be sometimes a little bit hampered. Real-time PCR can you give very specific information about the gene partners that you are tackling but because of limited multiplexing capacities, it is difficult to really get all the different gene fusion events that might be present. Since several years now, next generation sequencing came much more into focus because you just have the open, more open capabilities that you have. You have multiplexing capacities, and you can really look also for the gene fusion events. Of course, NGS-based fusion detection is very you know, different. You can use a whole transcriptome fusion sequencing just to really get a complete view. But this is a highly laboratorious uh, um, uh, and especially bioinformatic work to really get out this very specific fusion events. There are different other technologies around that have different strengths and weaknesses. You know? I will concentrate more on the AmpliSeq technology because of the technology that we are using since several years in the lab now, and I will show you where are the strengths really of this assay. We also use the other technologies. They have specific questions, especially if we go beyond just the targeted approaches, but want to have more insights. The AmpliSeq technology is quite known. It's a PCR-based multiplexing technology. The great strength of the assay, of course, is that we have these very low input amounts that we really need. Typically, we try to use between 10 to 15 nanograms in a very easy and fast workflow. 
What we are doing in the technology itself, of course, we have different primers on the five prime and the three prime genes beyond the breakpoints. You generate like an RT-PCR fragment that is then sequenced. We, since about 2016, 2015, uh, we completely switched in our laboratory from fish-based fusion detection to an NGS-based workflow for the lung cancer diagnostics. So our workflow since then is that we are using a single extraction of uh, the tissue slides using both DNA and RNA extraction from the very same slides to be really assured that we save the tissue material, that we have the precious material. Since then, we have several iterations of DNA and RNA panel that we are using for lung cancer just to adapt really on the novel, technology, on the novel uh, targets that we also need to, to, uh, to tackle. Everything is then done by automatic uh, ein chef and INS torrent, ever PGM nowadays only S5 sequencing. We will do this, we do this in a, in a high throughput um, scenario. We'll come to it in a minute. Uh, we have, for example, this typical custom AmpliSeq panel. It's very similar also to Focus Essay, uh, where we have different fusion partners, for example, especially, of course, for ALG, RED, ROS, but also having uh, targets for MET. I will come later to that. In the beginning, before we translated it, of course, we did a, a, through, a thorough uh, validation of different panels using different uh, fusion targets that we were testing. And we had a very, very high success rate uh, with almost 100% really of all the fusions that were detected. Since then, um, we just published uh, uh, a paper about uh, that the first roughly 3,000 lung cancer patients that were analyzed in our routine lab this is just a little bit an overview of the fusions that we were able to detect. Of course, if you look at the different ALK fusions, most of them are fusions with the EML4 gene, but a different variant because of the different exons that fuse together. I will come to that also later. But we also detected uh, some, some uh, EML4 variants that were not reported before that were novel fusions. How can we do that? There are different uh, things what you can do because they are not really targeted approaches in this panel. You need some specific primer, of course, to detect them. But the options that you have are, first of all, in one way, we always use an ALK immunohistochemistry in combination with all the different samples. That is, that we don't miss anything. But in all these different cases, we don't, didn't have any right uh, or very few discrepancies. The other thing that this assay actually um, uh, uh, also implements is an imbalance assay. That means you're looking for five prime and three prime expression of a certain gene of ALK, for example. In the case of a gene fusion, usually the three prime part will be much higher expressed because it's under a different promoter. This assay really allows you to, to look for imbalance assays. And then you might have a different view on the, uh, on the different targets and might cross-validate it. It's really uh, working also in a, high, in a high throughput. For example, i just show you some of the results that we had. So very few cases actually, very saw imbalance assays and positive ALK fusion EHC without any known target, but they were really then also able to validate these. Why should we have a look really on the fusion partner and how this variant really looks like. For EML4, there are different, as I said, different variants of this class. Most dominant is this V1 variant, which uh, targets exon 13 of, of EML4 uh, to exon 20 of ALK. But the other really important one is this V3 variant. Now, in collaboration with our Faraki clinic, we were looking but more specifically on the clinical outcomes actually in between these different variants. And what was very uh, uh, clear in, in the beginning when we asked our Paraki clinic is that this V3 variant often had a much worse prognosis compared to other variants. So we really sequenced all the different cases that we had, identified the variant, and then looked what happens actually there. What is, what is beyond that? And what we observed is that this V3 variant has, in the beginning, before even we start with any kind of treatment, 
often we see much more metastatic sites compared to V1 or V2 variant. Also, if we then look for crescent-free survival after first-line TKE treatment, we see that this V3 variant really has a much worse prognosis compared to the other variant. This is even more pronounced if in combination to this V3 variant, we also see a TP53 mutation. In these cases, the static sites are even higher and the prognosis is even worse. That means this is a really important information that you can get if you use a targeted sequencing approach where you really get the fusion partner with the exact breakpoints in combination also with DNA sequencing. This really provides you much more information uh, if you just would use any combination of a FISH approach or EHC approach compared. This one-stop shop that we have in this lab also enables, of course, the simultaneous detection then of the variant uh, uh, resistant mutations that obligatory uh, are really uh, after some treatment with tyrosine kinase inhibitors also occur. It's very interesting always to see that the resistant sites are very similar between the different genes, independent also what kinase inhibitor you're using. So it doesn't matter if you have an eye cross head, so the sites that you see where resistant mutations occur are very similar. So um, this is also then, of course, then seen that if you then really look at the sequencing and you see the different mutations. So this is also something that's really important for the clinicians to really know in the end. Are there mutations, especially for IQ, you can switch to different uh, therapies then and you have much better gain on for the patients. Another point that you can tackle with such an RNA fusion detection method is the question, for example, presence of this MET exon 14 skipping mutation in lung cancer. Just to remind you, MET exon 14 skipping is an event that can happen if there are mutations at the splice acceptor splice donor sites in exon 14 of the MET gene, which can then lead to a skipping of this exon 14, which is a target for ubiquitinylation, therefore degradation of MET. If exon 14 is missing, you have a higher amount of MET in the cell and therefore a higher activity. The problem in detecting this MET exon 14 skipping event is the diversity of mutations that can occur in the MET gene. This can be small point mutations at the, the splice sites itself. There can be larger deletions around the different splice sites. But it can be also, for example, just intronic deletion. The problem, of course, here is the question, is this a real mutation that leads to exon 14 skipping? This cannot be completely solved by this. What you can do, and that is also in the panel, on RNA side, we have primers on exon 13 and exon 15. And if the fusion is present, you will see it by this, by this targeted approach also. Usually we then see recounts that are very high. There is sensitive, it's a very sensitive assay. Um, so we often really see also the skipping event with few reads, but they are not true. But in the case of a real true mutation, you have really high sensitivity in this assay. And this really helps you to decide is there an exon 14 skipping yes or no. Lung cancer is not the only I said this in the beginning already, so we have more programs running where we are looking for gene fusion events also in a lot of different other entities. We are using heavily this on-command comprehensive RNA panel in the V3 version. We have also different other panels in place, as I said, for example, using the Archer technology, but also hybrid capture-based approaches. Um, and we have several programs, as I said, that are running in uh, different tumor entities, you see, just want to compare what is uh, the difference between these two different approaches, for example, an Archer multiplex assay compared to an AmpliSeq. What you see on the library preparation side is the library preparation, of course, for AmpliSeq is much easier compared, is much faster, and you need much less material, actually. Of course, you have a little bit the strength of the AMP on the other side, 
that detects also unknown fusion because it's not a targeted approach in itself, but has an open end. But both of these assays have a very valid uh, uh, points. As I said, the input amount, for example, for the ARM technology is about 200 nanogram. So this is, of course, the 10 times what you really need for an ARM physics technology. But the strength is, as you said, detection of known fusions, of, of yet unknown fusions because of the technology approach. But just to come to a point here, you can also detect so far unknown gene fusions, not only by these imbalance assays, but because of just non-targeted events. So we had several cases where we see yet unknown jet, uh, gene fusions where the three prime, five prime partner were a part of the panel, but usually they were designed for different other fusion partners. So this is also a way how you can detect unknown fusion with an amplic seek technology. The identified gene fusion, I don't want to go into details, you see that in the different tumor entities we see different also recurrent gene fusions. This is a mixed population, many of them were carcinoma of unknown primaries, so these are programs that really help the oncologist and also pathologist to decide which is the right therapy for these patients. It's an open, open uh, trial that we have running. For the last few slides, just want to come to what is coming now also this year, are these enteric gene fusions. Again, it's the same uh, principle like for the ALK fusions, of course. <laughs> the difference is that we have a whole variety and diversity of cancers that present actually these enteric gene fusions. Some of them are really prominent, like this, uh, this mass, this secretory, uh, analogous secretory uh, cancers that have a high um, um, percentage of these ETV6 uh, enteric free fusions. But in a lot of different other entities, the, f the, the percentage of fusion that can be detected is quite low. So that is, of course, a little bit problem. So um, we need, of course, sensitive methods um, that allow us to detect these gene fusions. But because of the low penetrance of these, in the, uh, the low frequency of these, it's always better to have a complete assay that targets, of course, much more of these different gene fusions than just on restricting just the NTREX. Why is it important that we tackle NTREX? Because there is a very good response rate to these targeted inhibitors that are now coming into market. So therefore, this is, if we find the NTREX fusion also in these very few cases, it's really important for the patients. There are now several guidelines on the way. I don't have the time to really go into that. But as you see, NGS is a very important method that is considered now as a gold standard for the, and, and for the NTRAC testing, combination also a little bit with immunohistochemistry. What is the right uh, assay to do? That's a difficult question. It depends on so many different factors. The Oncommand Comprehensive Assay V3 offers you, for example, a whole list of different partner genes for the NTREX. You see it for NTREX 1, 2, and 3. So it's a good opportunity already. There are, will be new, new uh, partners will be added, maybe coming then in the next version of the, of the assay to even have a more and broader possibility to detect these gene fusions in the future. By that, I would come to a short conclusion that we believe, strongly believe, that the amplicity fusion detection is a very good method. We have very low dropout rates, maybe to add this also in the end. So in the lung samples, we, we roughly see maybe 5% of sample dropouts, also from more degraded samples. Uh, so it's a really robust and easy method for fusion detection. By that, of course, I would like to thank the entire team in Heidelberg, the Foreca Clinic, National Center for Tumor Diseases and all different points. Want to thank you for your attention.